Okay, in the textbook, there's this theorem called RREFU. Reduced row echelon form is unique. The statement of the theorem, suppose that A is an M by N matrix, and that B and C are M by N matrices that are row equivalent to A and in reduced row echelon form, then B equals C. In other words, two reduced row echelon forms that are equal to some matrix are actually the same matrix. There's only one reduced row echelon matrix that's equivalent to any given matrix. Now, uh, in the in the book, if you go back, there's a there's a fairly long proof of this, which you can read. Uh, there's always multiple ways of proving something, but I want to see if I can relate this theorem to a previous theorem that we have that maybe seems a little bit more clear. Uh, this theorem here. Oh, let me get the color going. This theorem here that says row equivalent matrices represent equivalent systems. This is a theorem that we showed before. We didn't actually show it, but we showed many examples uh, why this should be true. Uh, suppose that A and B are row equivalent augmented matrices then the systems of linear equations that they represent are equivalent systems. Okay, so you take one matrix and you perform row operations. Whatever matrix you get will have will be equivalent. In other words, it will have the same, it'll have the same solutions. Okay, so I want to use this fact, this R-E-M-E-S fact, to get a handle on this theorem R-R-E-F-U. And I'm going to actually uh, give outline a proof of this REFU using this REMS, and it's in several stages. Now, that's really what you try to do with a proof that is somewhat uh, involved. You try to break it down into bite-sized pieces. So let's go through these steps one by one. The first step says uh, the row echelon matrices B and C represent equivalent systems. That is, they have the same solutions. Okay, so we're talking about B and C up here. These B and C are row equivalent to A. Since they're row equivalent, they, re they represent equivalent systems. This is true by R-E-M-E-S. As long as we can show that the matrices are row equivalent, then they must have the same solution. So that's going to be the basis of our proof, that B and C represent systems that have the same solutions. And we're going to show, basically, that any two row echelon matrices that have the same solutions must in fact be the same matrix. In other words, the row echelon form uniquely determines the solution set of the system represented by the row echelon form. Okay, so let's go at this step by step. Second step says the matrices, so, um, so just to go through the strategy here, we're going to show piece by piece that these two matrices have to be the same. First we're going to show they must have the same first pivot column. Okay, remember the pivot column is a column with a 1 in it and all the others are 0. Okay, after we show this, then we're going to show that all pivot columns of the two matrices must agree. Then we're going to show the final columns of the two matrices must agree. And then we're going to show that all remaining columns must agree. Okay? And the key to all of these proofs is this idea that B and C must represent systems that have the same solutions. All right, so let's look at the proof of two. All right, so um, if let's let's consider matrix B, and if column one is a pivot column of B, then the value of x one x one is the variable corresponding to column one, is determined by x two up through x n. Now we've seen that before. Just go back to this example here, a system of equations that gives this reduced row echelon form. Here you see the first column is a pivot column. From this first equation, we derive this equation here, x1 plus x3 equals 3. So the value of x1 is determined from the value of x3. We can solve this for x1, x1 equals 3 minus x3. And that's always going to be true if the first column is a pivot column. We'll always have an equation involving x1. x1 equals all the rest of the stuff. So all the rest of the variables will determine the value of x1. Okay, so that's the key point here. 
On the other hand, if the first column is not a pivot column, then the value of the variable x1 can be anything. Because if you write out the system of equations, then x1 doesn't appear in any of the equations. x1 is arbitrary. Okay, so we have two different cases here. If x1, if column one is a pivot column, then the value of x1 is determined by the other variables. If x1 is, if column one is not a pivot column, then the value of x1 can be anything, no matter what the other variables are. So these are two distinct cases. Since B and C must have the same solutions, then either column one is a pivot column for both, in other words, the value of x1 is determined by the other variables, or for neither, in other words, the value of x1 is arbitrary for both B and C, because they must have the same solutions. Okay, so column one is, so either column one is the first pivot column for both, or it's the first pivot column for neither. And we can go on, uh, so if column one is the pivot column for neither, then go on to column two and make the same argument. Okay, if column two, column one's not a pivot column, column two is a pivot column, uh, then, then uh, variable x2 is uniquely determined by the other variables. We can do the same argument, and by this argument we can show that the first pivot column for B must be the same as the first pivot column for C. So that checks off number two here. Okay. Now I want to go one step farther. We want to show that all pivot columns of B and C must agree. Okay. And the proof of that is down here. All right. So, so if column M is a pivot column, say of matrix B, then every solution with fixed values of xm plus 1 through xn, the value of xm is fixed. Okay, so what am I talking about here? Uh, let, let's go here to this example. All right, here's a pivot column here. Now, the, this, uh, I'm making the same argument that I made before, that the value of x2 is determined by the values of the variables in these columns, plus the constant term. So the value of x2 is determined by, in this case, it's determined by this equation. It's not free. It can't be just anything, but, it, but once I know what x3 is, x2 is determined. And that's always going to be the case when you have a pivot column. The, the variable in the pivot column is going to be determined by the variables to the right of that pivot column. Okay, so that's the point that's being made here that if column M is a pivot column, then once the larger variables, the variables with larger index are determined, then the value of the variable XM is fixed. On the other hand, if column M is not a pivot column, then for any solution with fixed values of these larger variables, these variables with larger index, we can find a solution for any value of XM because there's no equation that determines XM uniquely. Okay? So the argument is similar to the, the part of two. Now, since B and C have the same solutions, any column that's not a pivot column for B must also not be a pivot column for C and vice versa. Because if, if you had a different situation for the two, you'd have different sets of solutions. In one case, you'd have arbitrary XM. In another case, you'd have non-arbitrary XM. You wouldn't have the same set of solutions. Okay? So that tells us that, in fact, all pivot columns of the matrix B and C must agree. Now again, I'll just point out that we're using the fact that B and C must have the same set of solutions. Any solution of B must be a solution of C and vice versa. Okay? So we've gone through two, we've gone through three, let's go to four. So the proof that the final columns of B and C must agree. Now, we've already established two and three, that they have the same pivot columns, that, that the two matrices have the same pivot columns. All right, so let's go on to the proof of four. Find the mouse here. So let's look at four. Now, if we set all independent free variables equal to zero, then the values of the pivot variables are determined uniquely by the entries in the last column. All right, let's see what I'm talking about here. Go back to our example, simple example here. In this case, we have one, two dependent variables, x1 and x2, and we have a free variable x3. Suppose I set x3 equal to zero. Well, if I set x3 equal to 0, then x2 must be equal to 2, and x1 must be equal to 3. We can see that in the system of equations down here as well. If x3 is 0, x1 is 3, x2 is 2. 
So that means that the values of the pivot variables, in other words, the dependent variables, are uniquely determined by the values in the last column. Now we know that B and C correspond to the same solutions. That must mean that the values in the last column must be the same for matrix B and for matrix C. Because otherwise, if they were different, then you'd have different solutions for B and C. Okay, so that tells us that the last column of B and C must be the same. So we check this one off. Okay. Now we're, we're almost there. The, the last part is to show all remaining columns must agree. We've shown the pivot columns agree. We've shown the last column agrees. We need to show all the other columns. We can call them the free columns or the columns corresponding to free variables. So let's see how this works. All right, so we're, so this is actually proof by contradiction. We're going to suppose the opposite of what we want to prove. Okay? What, we're, what we want to prove is that all entries of B and C are the same. So let's suppose that this, the, I'm, I, what I mean by this is B sub J, K. I can't write subscripts very easily on this software. But so I'm supposing that the J, K entry of B is not equal to the J, K entry of C. Okay. So this is the entry in the matrix. So if I have a matrix here, the JK entry is where? It's the jth, col jth row, kth column. Okay, so there's an entry here. Okay. And I'm supposing that the entry here in B is not equal to the entry in C. All right, so let's set all the uh, very, all three variables other than K equal to zero. Since this is the kth column, it corresponds to the kth variable. So I'm going to set all other free variables equal to zero. And then I'll set xk equal to one. Okay. Now if I do this, I can find a solution. Let me refer to this example that we saw in the book. Now this, this column corresponds to x1, this corresponds to x2, this corresponds to x3, and this corresponds to x4, and this is the constant column. So we have two free variables, x3 and x4. And say, I'm, suppose I focus on this entry here. This entry is the, the 2, 3 entry. So that has to do with variable x3. Now let's investigate the solutions where x4 is equal to 0. I'm going to set the other free variable equal to 0. So if x4 is equal to 0, what's the value of my solution? Well, to get x2, I'm going to use this equation here. This is actually not a good example. Let's make this 0. This is an inconsistent example. Let's make this 0 so we actually have a solution. All right, so, so, if, so let's go back here. We're setting x4 equal to 0. We're setting x4 equal to 0, and we want to find the value of x2. Well, x2 is going to be equal to 0 minus x3. Okay, but let me set x3 equal to 1. Okay, so I'm, that's going to be zero, equal 0 minus 1. So that's minus 1. Now, where does this minus 1 come from? This minus 1 comes exactly from the value of this entry. Okay, the zero comes from here, the minus one comes from this entry. If the entry here is different, then I'm going to get a different value for x2. So if b and c have a different value in this position, then x2 will be different for the solution where x4 is equal to zero, x3 is equal to one. That's not possible because we've already said that b and c have the same set of solutions. So this specific example shows this general principle that I have here that if two entries non non-pivot columns of B and C are not equal then we can find a solution of one that's not a solution of the other set all other pivot variables equal to zero and set that particular pivot I'm sorry set all other free variables equal to zero and set that particular free variable equal to one then we can write down xj for the solution for B and we can write down xj for the solution for c. Now these two solutions must agree. So this xj must be equal to this xj. We've already shown that the last column of b is equal to the last column of c. So this entry here, this last entry here, must equal to this last entry here. Because, and you can just solve it out. 
If you want to find BJK, BJK is going to be equal to BJN plus 1 minus XJ. But since, and, and you also have, so we can write this out, BJK is equal to, well, let's make sure I do this right, BJN plus 1 minus XJ. We also have CJK, similarly, CJK is equal to CJN plus 1 minus xj, all right? Now we've, uh, uh, minus, minus xj, okay? So we know that these two are equal, we know that these two are equal, so these two must be equal. They must be equal, okay? That contradicts our assumption that they were not equal. We have the case where we, we've shown that in fact, all entries of B and C must be equal. We finish the proof of this theorem that two reduced row echelon forms that are row equivalent must in fact be the very same matrix. Okay, so that's it for the proof.